Well, I think it's appropriate that we're here today, Larry, in the Ladies' Library Association building to talk about the subject of women in Kalamazoo. Of course, this building has played an important role in the history of women. The Ladies' Library Association was founded uh, in 1852, but earlier in the 1840s, there were two women, Mrs. Kendall and Mrs. Ransom, who got together, and it started out as a reading club, and then later they organized as the ladies library and it met at various locations and then finally built this very beautiful building uh, completed it in 1879 it really is a yeah. magnificent building isn't it and I believe this was the first building erected solely for the use of a woman's club in the country that's right in fact they even had to change state law so that women could own property because back then women could not own property yeah. and it really is quite a gem in in our it's, uh, it's, it's an architectural monument to Kalamazoo women. And uh, Kalamazoo women have really been important in the state's history and even mm -hmm. in many aspects of national history. Mm -hmm. uh, Lucinda Hinsdale Stone had something to do with the Ladies' Library. Very much so. Lucinda was the found, one of the founders of the Ladies' Library. In fact, she was called the uh, mother of, of women's clubs. And Lucinda came to Kalamazoo in 1843, her mm -hmm. husband at that time, Dr. J.A.B. Stone, was uh, going to uh, be the pastor of the First Baptist Church and also the president of the Kalamazoo Literary Institute, which we now know of Kalamazoo College. And the interesting thing back then, Larry, is that um, Lucinda was always interested in education. She was a teacher, she was a, a governess, even went down to Mississippi for three years so she could see slavery firsthand. Mm -hmm. And when she came here to Kalamazoo, the Literary Institute, of course, they had men go there, but she wanted to start a female division, which they did, and they, uh, at that time, the building was in the park, the Academy Building, uh, which is in now Bronson Park. And even though they were considered separate institutions, they still met in the same building. And I know even they had classes together, and I think that probably some of the conservative Baptists in Kalamazoo mm. were probably uh, you, uh, struck by. You by didn't have co-ed classes in those days. No, you really didn't, especially in in uh, count the college, which is what what that was considered. Uh, later on, uh, she did have her own building, which was called Kalamazoo Hall, which stood on South Street. But in 1863, I think probably because of the Stones' liberalism and very mm -hmm. free thinking, uh, the kind of people they were, they resigned from the college. I think uh, there were many different factors involved with that. Yeah. And then she started her own school called the Kalamazoo Female Seminary. Mm -hmm. And then another thing she did, between 1867 and around, I think it was 1888 or so, she took young women on trips to Europe and uh, sometimes they would be gone anywhere from nine to twelve months and they would travel all around Europe. Mm. It was a sort of traveling kind of thing. And a uh, remarkable woman, in fact, really after, when she died uh, in 1900, I think it, it was uh, in her will, her books were worth more than her clothes. Which I think is very appropriate. Everyone should be. And, you know, <laughs> I knew you would say that. And, uh, you know, Lucinda was just, um, we just call her the, the mother of uh, clubs. Mm -hmm. There were many other organizations around Kalamazoo, many different types of clubs, like the 20th Century yeah. Club. That's, that's one that I found interesting. It was uh, started just before the Columbian World's Exposition uh, th that's that was right. to happen in 1893 to prepare Kalamazoo women to take a greater part in it, mm -hmm. to read up and study and be aware of what was happening. Well, they liked what, what was happening with the club so well that they decided to continue the club. And so they thought of a different name. Originally, it was the Isabella Club, and they changed it to the 20th Century, Century Club, and it became very important. So there were a lot of different clubs and organizations, and I, and I think that this was a way of, of women to continue their education. Yes. I think a lot of these women, especially Lucinda, felt that education just didn't stop once you left school. Yes. You continually had to keep going. And that gets into another subject with women. Of course, that's education. Yes. Um, women, you know, young girls, ever since 1833, I think, always went to school with boys, at least grade schools. Yes. Uh, whether it be uh, Kalamazoo High School and, and uh, even the Parsons Business School that started in 1869. I don't think they ever... Uh, during those times, the photographs that I've seen included women in the Parsons yes. Business School, which is now part of Davenport College. Right. I don't think I've ever seen any pictures that had separate facilities no. for women there. Although I think most of the students would have been men. At That's that time. true. That's true. Because, a great majority uh, of them. Stenographers and uh, 
people who took long hand even were, were men, predominantly. Mm -hmm. uh, before we leave Lucinda, there's one other story that, that I find interesting. When she taught that school that was situated in Bronson Park, mm -hmm. which was originally a branch of the University of Michigan, That's right. the structure in was put there. Yeah. The citizens in Kalamazoo didn't appreciate having that school down in what they considered their park, their mm -hmm. opens. The commons. Mm -hmm. And so one night they put two big logs underneath it and moved it right out into the middle of the that's street. That's how they did it. I always wondered how they moved Much that building. Much to her chagrin the next morning. But uh, Well, I think that's one of the reasons why the citizens of Kalamazoo raised the money for the Kalamazoo Hall on South Street. I think they yes. felt sort of sorry for what they did yes. Uh, yes. in atonement for their sins. Yes. Um, so that, some good did come out of it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. And that, um, of course, another institution that dealt with women, I'm always been fascinated with is the Michigan Female Seminary, Yes, which opened in 1867 and was here. And that was a little different. It, it wasn't so much a college. It was more they, they tried to pattern it after a, a uh, finishing school. Uh, wasn't there one in Massachusetts that they emulated? Yeah, well, they, they even modeled it after Mount Holyoke. Mm -hmm. In fact, many of the early pictures that you'll see, they call it the Mount Holyoke of the West. Oh. And I think that confuses some people when they're looking at these pictures. And it was sort of preparing women. They would te take French and Latin and mm -hmm. things like that. It was very expensive, though, and that, uh, it finally closed around 1906. But, but you know, Larry, you and I were talking about this. Not not every woman could afford a, a higher education. No. Oh, I know. Oh, I know one thing. Before I forget, we better uh, while we're talking about education, we're talking about female seminaries. The University of Michigan. Yes, Madeline Stockwell immediately right. comes to mind. Who was the first woman to enter the University of Michigan? in February of, of 1870, and she came from Kalamazoo. There were a lot yeah. of women from Kalamazoo who went to Michigan. There, there were, uh, and, and women that didn't just sit at home. Uh, they, they got out of the house and did things important. The, one of the very first women uh, in Kalamazoo, Titus Bronson, the founder's wife, Sally Bronson, she seemed to be a woman of some degree mm -hmm. of dominance. Uh, there's there's one uh, sort of apocryphal story that uh, he got disgusted with her because she was so bossy that one day he said he, he took one of his suspenders and said go ahead take them take them take <laughs> take the, you want to wear the pants in the family go ahead and wear them and and I don't know why but wasn't one of the plat maps put in her name one of the early plat yeah, maps yeah the property was was, it was in her name and so mm -hmm. she was a woman of business a sense as well and unfortunately the only photograph we have of Sally is from a coolie painting yes. that just shows her milking a cow so we don't have a true photograph of, of Sally yes. uh, around in there. Uh, but not every woman could go to a, a club such as this or go to uh, the University of Michigan for no. kind of education. That's a whole other aspect of it. There really is. Uh, now, there were not very many avenues left open to women in the pioneer days mm -hmm. other than to be a housewife and to work hard and take care of the large families that were expected of them. Uh, in Kalamazoo, we didn't see women really as a part of the workforce until around the time of the Civil War. The first record I found of a woman working in a store, I think, was in the 1850s, and mm -hmm. the, it was so unusual that the editor of the Kalamazoo Gazette, uh, Gazette noted that we are very pleased to see a young lady working in this establishment, and so it made the newspaper. It was so unusual. But then following, uh, well, largely because of the Civil War, there were so many men in, in the mm -hmm. army, uh, many of the tasks usually allotted to men fell on women's shoulders. Oh, that's interesting. And uh, they found out, much as they did during other wars, later wars, that women could do these things that were not considered appropriate for them before. And so following the Civil War in uh, Kalamazoo, we see women start entering the workforce, getting jobs in the factories. And we see more and more factories coming to Kalamazoo that mm -hmm. uh, utilize many women. I guess uh, uh, some of the ones that stick out in my mind is the cigar industry. Mm -hmm. uh, they, this was a relatively high paying job, but it was all hand labor. Uh, and uh, they employed many women and young boys in there to, to make hand make mm -hmm. cigars. Mm -hmm. Millions of them a year in Kalamazoo. Uh, probably the biggest employer of women in Kalamazoo, at least by the turn of the century, was the Kalamazoo Corset Company. Mm -hmm. and there's an interesting story with how that came to Kalamazoo. Uh, it was originally called the Featherbone Corset Company. Now, Featherbone was a substitute for whalebone, mm -hmm. which was used in, in corsets as stays. But whales were becoming more and more extinct, and so a man down in, in Three Oaks, Michigan, named Warren, uh, got an idea of turning turkey quills 
into this substance that he called feather bone. It was an ideal substitute for whale bone. A little uh, hamlet of three oaks took off. Uh, a large factory was erected. And many women came down there to work. There were uh, really uh, many carloads of women coming into town looking for a job at the same time as these box carloads mm -hmm. of turkey feathers were coming <laughs> in. It must have been an unusual sight. <laughs> Uh, but a man named James Hatfield moved the plant from Three Oaks to Kalamazoo around 1891 mm -hmm. and renamed it the Kalamazoo Corset Company. And by the turn of the century, it was the world's largest producer of corsets. Now, no woman in her right mind would ever consider going out of the house unless she was securely bolstered mm -hmm. in a corset in those days. So there was a market. Uh, they hired oh, over 800 women to work there under very stringent working conditions. Uh, the 10 hour day was the norm and the six day work week was the norm. And women, uh, a woman, if she was lucky, could manage to make maybe eight to ten dollars a week wages. So it wasn't anything like commission if they made so many corsets? To a certain extent, but uh, they, they couldn't make much more than $10 even if they were very good. Mm -hmm. And then there was the practice of fining them for anything that went wrong. They had to buy their own thread, mm -hmm. their own needles, their uh, scissors, mm -hmm. and if uh, the machine broke down and there was oil on one of the corsets, that was deducted from their pay. No, you know, I, I don't want people to think that we, Kalamazoo was an area that had no labor strife. We had very strong unions here, and of course yes, the we did. Kalamazoo corset industry was also hit by a strike. What was it, in 1912? It, it was hit by a strike, and uh, this is uh, a few remnants of that strike. Uh, in 1912, uh, there was organization there. And the women went out uh, basically for higher wages. Mm -hmm. uh, this thing that is, has survived here, shall we work for 50 cents to a dollar a day? No, they said. We protest against pauperizing Kalamazoo corset girls. People, supporters mm -hmm. would have worn, wore these in town. Mm -hmm. Well, they were out on strike for uh, several months, and uh, really not much happened as a result of that strike. When they settled, um, they didn't get hardly any increase in wages. I think even Josephine Casey came in for that strike. She did. She's a yeah. famous uh, organizer and came in and oh there were songs written about it mm -hmm. and it was uh, it was quite a affair. Most people uh, judging from the newspaper accounts uh, didn't side with the women. Mm -hmm. the, the general attitude in those days was that if a woman went out on strike she also put a man out of work and the man was the breadwinner and that was the major thing that a man could keep his job. Women worked only until they could get married. That was what society thought women were to do. Well, it was just like the Upjohn Company. When the Upjohn Company got started in uh, 1886, uh, for many, many years, it was known as the marriage factory. Yes. Because once women uh, were married, then they had to leave. And a lot of these women met their husbands at the Upjohn Company. Yes. Uh, same thing with uh, education, teachers. We know that the predominantly all the teachers in Kalamazoo were women, but especially during the Depression, if you were married, you had to leave your job. So this Te carried teaching on for a long was time. one job that, from the early days, was considered respectable for mm -hmm. a woman to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a book here that was published in the 1890s titled "What Can a Woman Do." <laughs> And it shows the contemporary attitudes. Uh, these, this, this contains descriptions of jobs that are suitable for women. And they couldn't do everything. They could be a poet, they could be a cook, and they, mm -hmm. could, they could keep bees. But apparently they were not encouraged to do many of the things that are now very commonplace. We've had some strong business women in Kalamazoo, yes, like, for have. example, uh, Carrie Gilmore Upjohn. Yes. Uh, her husband, uh, James Gilmore had died in 1908, and then she took over the running of the Gilmore Brothers department store. And the interesting story about Carrie was that uh, the store was going through a major expansion, and she had to negotiate a loan at that time, and no bank in Kalamazoo would give her money because mm. she was a woman. And she had to go to Grand Rapids to get financing for the construction of the building, and it was ironical that about 10 years after her husband had died, the sales of the store had almost doubled to like a million. So she had a, and yeah. I know there was someone in the paper company too. Helen King, uh, her husband died. He was the head of the uh, Rex paper mill and he died around 1930. And through the 30s, she was the only woman in the country that was president of a paper mill. It was, and she ran it very well. Now there were women that worked in the paper mill, right? 
Yes, uh, in particular jobs, not the heavy jobs in the paper mills, but uh, in the sorting, mm -hmm. in the sorting rooms. Uh, in, in Kalamazoo, at least, uh, they used a lot of scrap paper and they used a lot of linen rags and things like that to turn into paper. Well, somebody had to pick through there and separate it and take the buttons off the paper. And so women found employment there. Mm -hmm. Medicine. You know, the, the first doctor in Kalamazoo, I think her name was Laura Plants. Laura Plants. Uh, uh, most of the history books credit Matilda know, Towsley with being across. the first doctor, but thanks to Catherine uh, Larson at mm -hmm. the, at the uh, Kalamazoo Public Library, mm -hmm. she alerted me to the fact that there was one several years before named Laura Plants who uh, received a full medical diploma uh, from a school in Philadelphia and uh, moved to Kalamazoo shortly after the Civil War mm -hmm. and conducted a medical practice. Uh, she was the first woman in Vermont to practice, the first woman in Michigan to practice, mm -hmm. and she moved out to Minnesota, became the first woman in Minnesota. Minnesota. Now, the curious thing about her, uh, contrary to what you might expect, she was an advocate against women's suffrage. Huh. She debated some of the leaders of the mm -hmm. suffrage movement mm -hmm. and uh, thought that, no, it was not good for a woman to get uh, into the suffrage, to be active in politics, because she would learn some of the dirty things that were connected with politics. Mm -hmm. And Matilda. Matilda Towsley. When yes. did she come to Kalamazoo? She, she came in 1869, I believe. And, okay. Um, and worked as a doctor here for, oh, 40 years, I believe, specializing in family practice. Uh, Della Pierce was another mm -hmm. early doctor. And some other women that, that were uh, in medicine that I, I like to point out were the Upjohn women. Yes. That you always hear about the, the brothers that started the Upjohn company, but uh, you don't hear too much about the women. And, of course, uh, Helen, the oldest daughter, was a doctor, graduated from the University of Michigan. And then there were two daughters that graduated with degrees in pharmacy, although I don't think that they wanted to be practicing pharmacists. They just said that it was the easiest degree to get through at Michigan at that time. And then there was Pamelia Kirby Upjohn, who was married to Henry. Mm -hmm. uh, they got married in 1872, and her first son was born in 1873. And after that, Larry, I, I'm just amazed. She went back to the University of Michigan to go to medical school in 1874 because she wanted to be an equal with her husband, and she wanted to help her husband with his practice. And she graduated in 1876. And uh, what was interesting is when you look at her class, a lot of the women in her class were, were doctors, or I should say wives of physicians, mm -hmm. either wives or widows of physicians. So it seems like she wasn't the only one who had that idea yeah. to, help her, to help her husband. Uh, while we're on the topic of uh, medical practitioners, uh, they were not all as honest and uh, oh, reputable. Oh, we had a few, yes, few women quacks. We had huh? some women quacks. Uh, my favorite is, is Dr. M.E. Morell. Now, she called herself a doctor, but she also advertised herself as an electrician <laughs> because that was the treatment she gave. Oh, geez. Patients with any sort of complaint in the world came in. She had them immerse their feet in a bucket of water, and she ran a wand discharging electricity up and down their back. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes. Did uh, she lose any patients? Uh, it's not known, but Kalamazoo lost her after a couple <laughs> of years. She moved, I know why. <laughs> she moved on. Uh, along with uh, doctors, Kalamazoo has had a tradition of nurses mm -hmm. here. Julia Wheelock uh, graduated from Kalamazoo College in 1860 and then became a nurse during the Civil War. She wrote a book about her experiences called mm -hmm. The Boys in White. And she, of course, nurses at that time were not what we think of as nurses nowadays. Doctors didn't allow them to do very much uh, medical work. Mm -hmm. they, they held the hand of the boys that were wounded and helped them write letters and passed out food and things like that. Uh, we also had for a while, uh, work at the state hospital, America's first trained nurse. Linda Richards. Linda Richards. Well, I think she was here, I think it was like between 1906, 1909, somewhere uh -huh. in there. She was only here for a short time, yes. but you're right. She was the first, considered the first trained American nurse. Uh, and there's the, a building. Still there, I believe. That, that was named yeah. after, her. it's a correctional institute now. Yeah. So I think that's probably <laughs> what people think of when they think of Linda Richards. But she was really something. Now, did she write any books, Larry, Linda she Richards? She wrote an autobiography. And she doesn't talk very much about Kalamazoo, but... Mm -hmm. Now, you know, in, in the subject area of working women, there's a sort of other part of working women that Kalamazoo has had for a long time, and that's, of course, the area of prostitutes. Now, you, well, you've become an expert on this, well, <laughs> somewhat expert on this topic. Uh, 
Yes, through the luck, a book hunting adventure, I picked up this volume called A Magdalene's Life, mm -hmm. which is the autobiography of a prostitute who worked in Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo for several years. And she gives explicit details. This was published in the 1880s uh, about the area on the northern part of Kalamazoo called the Dock. She doesn't name the streets. I think it was uh, Ransom Street area. Okay. Uh, and tells about how she was deluded into getting mm -hmm. into this business. Uh, I was able to find corroboration for much of what she says in the newspaper accounts. Any uh, court of the records doc. did you get? Uh, into those? I haven't gotten into those yet, but I'm sure there would be. Mm -hmm. uh, Rush McNair, the, uh, the famous medical mm -hmm. historian of the area, talks memoir, about yeah. the, the wicked red light district. Mm -hmm. And he mentions a woman called Big Mary. <laughs> she was a character she, uh, among the uh, ladies of the evening. Uh, she was a huge muscular woman who did her own bouncing and she used to walk downtown and everyone got out of her way but uh, she was trying her best she was raising a, a niece mm -hmm. and uh, she was trying her best to raise her as a Christian she told Rush McNair when he visited her but uh, in the uh, all around 1887 uh, the red light district was raided and sort of closed mm -hmm. up and uh, you lose track of what happened to that but it's an aspect of history of women in history, I guess. Probably, I think, probably one of the most remarkable women that was ever in Kalamazoo was not someone who was born in Kalamazoo but came here in 1889, and that, of course, is yeah. Carolyn Bartlett Crane. And I think one of the things that's remarkable about her, Larry, is what she was before she came here. Talk about someone yes. who was a reporter, a homesteader, uh, yeah. a riverboat pilot, and then finally became, of all things, a minister. Yes. And then came here to Kalamazoo to take up the uh, become pastor of the Unitarian Church and you think of her, her challenge here she comes to Kalamazoo in 1889 she's a woman and the church has not met in four years and that has not had any services in four years and just think of the challenges that were ahead of her really and and she was just amazing woman full of energy in her spare time you can't imagine there would have been much she started yeah. the first kindergarten in the area mm -hmm. and started the, uh, the first manual training for young people and then went on to uh, do much research on uh, cleanliness, mm -hmm. a clean streets crusade. She launched one in Kalamazoo, I think in 1905, in which she had a, an army of white-coated men s sweeping up the streets and picking up the litter. Uh, went on to make a sort of a career out of that, traveling across the country doing uh, hygienic surveys of various cities, encouraging them to, to get rid of the disease was, wasn't she called like America's public homemaker? Yes, she was. Investigated uh, the slaughterhouses in Kalamazoo that were really uh, horrible places, uh, unclean, and it's uh, no wonder that many people were dying at that time. And she was the uh, one of the co-founders of the Women's Civic Improvement League yes. right, in Kalamazoo, yes. which, uh, among many other things in Kalamazoo, now went on a fly campaign to to get rid of the flies yeah. and stall and, screens uh, and yeah, rat bread and that kind of yeah. thing. And and it's interesting when you look at her church called the People's Church. Uh, it was renamed the People's Church, that she wanted to make it a seven-day working church. Yeah. So it didn't have a big tower and stained glass windows and everything like you think of as some of the churches. And she was a good friend of Lucinda's. I, yes, I think she they, was. And I think it really must have been something yeah. to see those two women together. Oh, I would have liked to have sat at their feet. <laughs> <laughs> of course, another thing that Carolyn was was an, an architect. Believe she it, yeah. just Her abilities never seemed to end. She would try anything. In uh, 1924, uh, President uh, Calvin Coolidge started a campaign to see who could build the most efficient house for every man, the average working mm -hmm. class citizen. And she entered that, uh, that campaign, that had never done any architectural work before, but drew the plans and, and talked local businessmen into donating the uh, material and erected every man's house, which mm -hmm. still stands halfway up West Nage West Hill. Hill. that's right. And this is the book that she wrote the next mm -hmm. year called Every Man's House. And it's really a remarkable house ahead of its time. It was the first house that really took the woman, the housekeeper, in mind. For example, before this, no one had thought of putting picture windows mm -hmm. over uh, the, in the kitchen so that you could, while you were doing dishes, you could look out. Or uh, installing the nursery right next to the kitchen so a woman didn't have to trudge up and down stairs to take care of the baby. It really was a remarkable achievement. Well, I have to say, too, to, to end this all, Larry, that I think we really have had some real remarkable women that have been here in Kalamazoo, whether they be the, the everyday person that works at the paper company to people like Lucinda Stone and Carolyn Bartlett Crane. 
I think we really have had some interesting people, interesting women here. Yes, and contributions to American. A lot of contributions, thought. not only to Kalamazoo history, but American history as well. Yep.